Welcome to Classical Chats, I'm Tiffany. Today we have an American saxophonist. Saxophonist! I'm excited because I don't really personally know much about saxophones. And I've met... I've realized this during the podcast that I've met one saxophonist before, but... Anyway, it's exciting for me to talk to Eric Jung because I'm very curious about the saxophone, also about classical saxophone, because usually we associate saxophones, I think, with jazz music, but he is a classical saxophonist. He's also part of a saxophone quartet, group two, and so we're going to learn about his journey, learn about what it's like to be a classical saxophonist. Hi, Eric. Good. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Good to meet you. Welcome to Classical Chats. So, how would I introduce you? Well, I know of you because you had interest in together with classical, so I thought you had an interesting story because I don't actually know any saxophonist. No, I don't know any <laughs> saxophonist. And so, I would love to learn about your career and your experience with saxophone, classical music. Because uh, I'm just curious. I love listening to jazz saxophone once in a while mm -hmm. when it comes up in, in random jazz albums that I listen to. But I am a complete dummy about the saxophone, aside from knowing that, you know, you blow air through it and it <laughs> sounds come out. So with that being said, <laughs> can you please introduce yourself and tell us how your journey with classical music started, which is for those who are listening multiple episodes by now, they know that this is the question that I ask every single guest. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, thank you so much for for bringing me on here. I, it's a uh, it's a really cool opportunity for me to to speak with you, um, and I really appreciate the interest and in everything. Um, you know, a lot of people really aren't familiar with the the concert saxophone or classical saxophone, and and to be fair, I really didn't. I knew no one. Sorry, I... when you said classical, I was like, wait a minute, I did know one. I performed once. With a saxophonist in Mordsburg Festival. It was a Mieux, uh something piece. I forgot the name. It was cool. But I did actually know. Or I played with one. So, okay. I'm curious. I'm still a dummy. But anyway, I, don't, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just got no, excited for a second. You're you good. said um, concert saxophonist. And I was like, wait a minute. I do know one. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I'd, be, I'd be curious um, as to, you know, who you played with. Because it's such a small uh, world out here. And so... Um, yeah, but but it's it's only recently I think that there's been more activity in the sort of the the classical concert saxophone world. Um, Stephen Banks, who uh, was actually my my old uh, GA at when I was at Northwestern, um, he is the first saxophonist to be on the young concert artists roster, um, mm. and you know he's you know been playing with them and and he teaches at Ithaca now. Uh, but, you know, as for my, my story, I suppose, um, maybe shall we go back to, I, I guess, you know, baby age, the, ba <laughs> the womb? No. Um, I, well, I mean, I, I don't know. Some people started late. Some people started before they were born in terms of experiencing classical music. Like myself, I heard classical music and also many genres of music before I was conscious. So yeah, yeah. I, I'm just curious to know from the very beginning how it started for everyone. For sure. I um, So I my, my family isn't a particularly like musical family. Uh, they My parents weren't really involved with music growing up, mm. but they really wanted me to participate in it when they emigrated here to the United States. Mm -hmm. So... I started classical piano lessons actually when I was around five years old and that, that got me interested at first, but then, you know, over time and, and as a kid, it, it became a sort of a chore for me and my, my friends, they, they weren't listening to classical music. And, um, I, I think early on and because of, uh, being an Asian American, I felt that I was starting to be boxed in by society to to be a certain type of person. Like, you know, I play piano, I'm good at math, or and I'm gonna be, I should be an engineer or something. And so, um, you know, early on, I, I knew that I, I wanted to try and change that narrative. And 
Um, my dad actually, he listens to a lot of Kenny G and, uh, <laughs> right. Classic. And now I, I play so much different music from Kenny G, but, um, I, uh, you know, I, I got started on the saxophone and I quickly, you know, fell in love with it. Um, and when did you start with the saxophone at what age? Cause it's not a usual instrument that a kid really, right. It, it's it was uh, so big <laughs> at the time. Yeah. Um, I started around the fifth grade. So that's when they really Ooh. introduced like band instruments and things to, to kids. Yeah. And, uh, and I enjoyed playing it band a lot because it was a chance for me to really interact with other musicians, play together. Mm -hmm. And um, I just enjoyed this novel aspect at first of, of singing through this instrument. And over time, I became more and more familiar with, with the classical side, like learning repertoire. I, I got a teacher. Um, and then in high school, I really became involved with my band program. There was the, the concert side, of course, but also the jazz band. And I, I really got interested in jazz as well. And I wish I had had put more more time at, uh, into that, um, but of course, juggling a lot of different things uh, at the time, and so uh, you know I had that that early background, um, but I actually wasn't intending on uh, pursuing music as a career for hmm. for a while, and I think what made you decide to go with music? I think it's one of those things that is. You you kind of have to constantly decide, and you you it's kind of because you can't stay away, you know. Um, so yeah. when I I actually did my undergrad in in both economics and saxophone, and I was prepared to you know I was going to get there, and um, I was going to see if if the music thing was going to work out well, or maybe would have to drop it. But I, I really quickly became in love with the, the studio and the culture. And I felt this uh, need to to get better for, for no reason, but just to get better, you know. And mm -hmm. uh, my teacher, Tamar Sullivan, there was a huge inspiration for me. Um, and many of the grad students, like seeing, seeing, for example, Stephen Banks perform and then a saxophone quartet being introduced to me, I had no idea that this was a like a, a type of chamber music that people pursued. And, uh, you know, a group of master students at the time, they're called noise now. Um, <laughs> and they're, they're professional quartet. And they, you know, they, they inspired me as well to continue pursuing this path and to find my own voice within this field. Um, you know, and, and throughout that, I just, I've just enjoyed playing more repertoire and, and integrating different uh, parts of, of my of my musical identity into that, and you know, for example, you know, early on, trying to reject a lot of Asian American, uh, Chinese type of uh, ideals and values, but but now I feel that I want to to get closer to that and bring bring that more to um, my playing and and my teaching, I guess. Hmm. So would you say that you're a classical saxophonist? Because I know you had that jazz influence early on. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I would say that. Yes, I would say that I'm a classical saxophonist because my my training has has been in that in sort of this like the Western conservatory type of, of model. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, more and more, I think it's really important that I think saxophonists especially, uh, but but I think it's great for all musicians to to become more versatile and to be always reaching for different kinds of music, um, to be opening your ears to um, perhaps, I mean not just music, but but things that literature, whatever it is that that uh, will change your perspective and will make you a more uh, well-rounded and holistic person because i think at the end of the day if you even if you're performing classical music this type of thing informs your your playing and your artistry mm -hmm. yeah definitely and that's why i decided to major in something 
not related to music really uh, when in college so that I could get a more well-rounded uh, view of the world and understanding just to, uh, yeah, I think it makes me play better. Yeah, I, hope. <laughs> I, I would, I mean, no. you know, I would love to hear more about how philosophy has, has informed your playing as well um, at some point. I mean, philosophy, it's, uh, I think more and more nowadays, I feel like it's the skill of arguing against myself. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> because that is the classic thing that I and everyone else who studied philosophy had to do in essays. You know, you can't just, um, I mean, you're trying to argue for a certain point of view, but you always have to uh, think of a dialectic way of approaching your argument. So you have to show the different sides and different holes in your argument. And if you have too many holes, then it, you're not going to have a good essay and it's not a good piece of writing at all. So yeah, that's uh, not to say that I like to get into arguments with people, but just because <laughs> I have to constantly think in many different perspectives. And yeah. uh, I think that has helped a lot. And that's also kind of why I had this idea to do classical chats to get to know different people because you know we would not have connected otherwise if it weren't for classical music and I yeah. know that it is so powerful it can connect me to gamers or to saxophonists or to uh, I don't know lots of engineers I've learned <laughs> uh, so yeah. uh, it's just amazing to connect with many diverse uh, opinions and get to know about them so yeah saxophone um <laughs> i really don't know anything how can you describe the classical saxophone repertoire for those who have never Ooh. heard of um classical saxophone because you know classical piano everyone knows bach mozart beethoven they can immediately think of composers and kind of the sound that it would be but uh yeah what's it like for classical saxophone yeah that's a that's a really uh, poignant question because you know the, the it's a lot of transcriptions, right? Transcriptions for sure. Uh, yeah. The the saxophone was um, invented, I believe, in 1846, and I only know this because it's uh, in my uh, it's part of my Wi-Fi password. So, uh, but anyway. Now the entire world knows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There you go. Um, I, uh, yeah. Anyway, so the so <laughs> its history compared to the rest of the instruments is just so young. Um, you yeah. know, you're talking about 200 plus years compared to thousands, maybe, you know, they're talking about transverse flute or, um, instruments like this. And, and so, uh, as you were saying, a lot of it is transcriptions. We, we try to steal from a lot of other instruments as much as we can try to understand the artistry, understand their playing, but. Are there particular instruments that you find a lot of saxophone transcriptions off it's usually either clarinet or flute uh, however oh, uh there definitely i mean there's been cello transcript like the rachmaninoff cello uh sonata is a popular one recently really yeah um it's i mean it such a good piece and also isn't it his birth i could imagine a third movement being very interesting mm -hmm. because of the longer notes but it is so hard, that piece. It's so difficult. So many notes. So difficult. Um, the second movement with the, is it, it's a scherzo, like, but it has like a very, um, I don't know how to describe it, but it's it's not usually the kind of feeling I associate with a sex film. Yeah. Just say, because it's like a very nervousness uh, in that second movement, if I remember correctly. Um, and... I think of sex swing as like long and lyrical and uh, maybe it's too romantic of a, of a assumption and generalization, but no. uh, wow. Rachmaninoff cello sonata. Yeah, no, I would, uh, oh. I would uh, encourage anyone out there to also check out. <laughs> I've, maybe I've talked about it too much, but Stephen Banks has a wonderful recording on, on YouTube of his yeah? the rendition. Um, and in is it on Spotify also? Yeah, uh, I don't know if it's on Spotify, actually. I think because it, it was a live uh, recital recording, mm. actually. You know something? This is definitely out of place, but uh, I have recently decided to ask every guest to curate a playlist of uh, pieces that you would like others to listen to. So if you can do that, uh, I will link it somewhere in the Spotify and we will 
yeah, for sure. feature a curated playlist uh, by each guest. Is it uh, interesting? Does it have to be you know saxophone music or I mean? No, anything? it couldn't be anything. I mean, I think having a few saxophone pieces sure. in there would be yeah, <laughs> very yeah. Uh, relevant. But also any yeah piece of music, classical and or neo classical, but you know, kind of uh, what you think others would enjoy and should listen to. Yeah, for, uh, absolutely. Um, I will definitely, I would love to do that. Um, yeah, especially because I've never heard of sex from quartet, for example. Yeah, I think that's, that's one of the things in people, people, I think it's a, it's one of these new and exciting mediums. Um, and, and as an instrument that is young, people aren't as familiar with it. And it's the level of playing keeps getting higher and higher. And mm. I, I think that for us as saxophonists, we're just trying to we just want to be included in the conversation, you know, and we want to be, um, we want to not be like, okay, he's, you know, that's good for a saxophonist, but like, oh, that's, that is just, it's good playing. It's good music, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but going back to your, your other point, you know, I just, for example, I just did a, there's a transcription of a piece, um, uh, Chen, uh, Chen Yi, who is on faculty at, University of Missouri at Kansas City, her piece Chinese Ancient Dances, I is originally written for clarinet. Um, and then she did a transcription for soprano saxophone and I performed that on my recital. And and the fantastic mm-hmm. thing about saxophone is that I I would rehearse this piece and I could send it to her and she, I could get the comments directly from the composer, you know, mm-hmm. and it's it's fantastic to be able to work with composers directly and who are who are living and and breathing with their music um to make the, make what their vision is come alive um yeah and in this day age, you can send it anywhere really yeah and it's not something that we can do with uh composers of the past unfortunately with the <laughs> classical canon of music so um are there more um classical saxophone compositions now yeah i think that more and more composers are being commissioned and writing for saxophone because we often will we just we are looking to perform and premiere pieces and be part of of new music and you know it's not every saxophonist that is seeking to do this but i think as a classical saxophonist, you need to have that, you need to have this forward and progressive mindset uh, to be, a, you know, a, a successful musician today. Um, and I think it's just, just part of it. And yeah, and that goes both ways for the composers, but also for the audiences. You know, I think mm-hmm. uh, one of the greatest things about uh being in the kind of contemporary scene is that, you know, you can, you're looking at the audiences to play music that feels representative of them and that feels relevant to them. Um, and I think it's important to just reflect upon and to connect with audiences that uh, maybe this is sort of on a tangent, but just to, to break sort of the barrier that happens with classical canon sometimes. And that's why I think it's so fantastic what you're doing here with, I mean, starting out with the vlogs and with the, and now it's together with classical, you're connecting with audiences who might not be as familiar um, instead of just, you know, going on stage and performing and then you're done. It's like, we get to know you and we get to understand the music through you as well. Um, and I think that yeah. makes more people inclined to, uh, to inclined to be interested in classical music. And I, and that's something that I, as I've made the decision to do music, I knew that I had to go in that direction uh, in terms of uh, programming, in terms of playing. Um, like I try to speak before every concert. I tried to um, explain the piece, especially contemporary repertoire, because it gets really, you know, it's wild. wild. <laughs> yes, that's a great word for it. It gets super yeah. wild. So you want to frame it in the most accessible way for people. And then they might be able to receive it in a very 
uh, productive way. Mm. So have you had similar experiences through your quartet, your saxophone quartet? Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's Tell one me about the, it. Yeah, sorry. The, uh, we, uh, even the name, our, so our name, the name of my, my group is uh, Group 2. <laughs> and then, which is already a very intriguing um right i we, name we always, itself. uh the so who's group one <laughs> exactly that that's funny because we <laughs> actually start every one of of our concerts we start off with group one couldn't make it so you get us tonight um mm. but the the genesis <laughs> of it was actually um that you know these days uh, groups tend to maybe overdo it um and we wanted to really, you know, simplify things. And John Mulaney, I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's a comedian. Um, but he made this joke one time that, um, you know, he's in this math class and they separated out the, the class into two groups. And the first group, they were super good at math. They were always went up to the board uh, and they always did the problems right. And they were named the Blue Angels. And then he was a part of the second group and they never really did the problems right. And they, uh, but they had a really good time together. They were always laughing and joking, but um, they, they called themselves group two. And so we sort of took that, that concept and, and just um, wanted to go after that because, you know, as much as we, we take playing the music as seriously as possible. But we also don't take us very seriously because we know that, you know, at the end of the day, we're here to perform, we're here to connect. And um, if we become too disconnected with the other, uh, with the audience and maybe um, too lofty, that we lose that connection with the music making. And so uh, that's that's maybe the, the sort of the, the origins of of the name it's very interesting story and uh yeah it's a uh, always fun to see the tongue-in-cheek and the behind the scenes story of music making so <laughs> so uh how long have you been playing in the saxophone quartet because you're also teaching aren't you yeah i i teach at uh, albion college but i i've been playing with this quartet when i started my master's so that was about uh a year and a half ago. No, that mm. was in uh, 2019. Um, so quite new, actually. Yeah. So we've we've uh, we knew immediately that we wanted to be a very very serious or not serious. We wanted to be uh, um, we wanted to go after it Russian. as a group. Or, yeah. And um, you know, so we quickly started rehearsing a lot. Um, you know, um, unfortunately, that year we the we, we couldn't um, do a lot more because of COVID, but, you know, now mm -hmm. uh, one of the things, I mean, we're, uh, we're one of the semifinalists for f the fish off competition. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Um, and so, you know, we've been just preparing for those kinds of things and um, hopefully we'll continue to, to play into the future. Yeah. That reminds me any tip since you come from a teaching position which means you have the experience and the uh, the maturity to answer a question like this for those who compete what is your advice for them especially for students because i think a lot of them are students uh, who listen to my podcast or uh, watch my videos yeah that's a really relevant question i i think i can answer this from both a student and a in a teacher perspective, because perfect, I you know I'm currently in sort of this competition world, but I'm also in the teaching world. So competitions can become very damaging without the right perspective. I think mm. um, in the past for me, I I think that as long as you understand that it's it's meant to to push yourself to the best of your ability and to it's almost a kick in the butt to get your repertoire get your artistry together you know you have to make these decisions these um you have to make uh, this commitment 
And I think that's a wonderful part of it. But at the end of the day, that's an external motivator. And Mm -hmm. if you allow one um, competition result to, to deter you from continuing or to discourage you from pursuing more rather than to motivate you, then I think that it's actually more productive to work on personal projects rather than competing. You know, it's, it's a, it's a mindset thing. And I think to a certain extent you can compete and you should compete for the sake of, of, um, continuing, continuing like technical excellence and, uh, figuring that out. But, you know, maybe, and especially in this day and age, maybe it's, it's a time to forego the competition and to make 10 recordings of your favorite repertoire and put your heart and soul and effort into it just the same way you would compete. But um, now you have this product, you have this physical recording and um, uh, that you can share with people and you know that you, you put in the same amount of effort. And I think what I've learned from being in the competition circuit is that is to approach the music making part of it and the learning and the process part with the utmost level of respect and humility to the music Mm -hmm. and leaving the competition circuit. um, Then it's kind of more of like, I can take that approach and, and do it for any future projects. And, and, you know, at the end of the day, um, like, cause I'm competing with, with the group as well. One judge's comment is, is also an opinion. And one day, you know, as I get older, hopefully I'll also be a judge for some other competitions, but it will also only be my opinion. Um, and I think, you know, younger students forget that while music, while there are certain objective qualities of music, um, it is still a very personable, personal experience and, and subjective. And everyone does listen to and experience music in different ways. Yeah. So how do you envision the future for concert saxophone community, how they would experience the music? Yeah. Um, you know, I would just encourage... I, and I think it is moving in this direction and is that, um, you know, the concert saxophone community is hopefully it, it can be sometimes of a, a bubble. Um, there's a, so the, the organization, um, not North American saxophone Alliance, it's NASA for short, <laughs> we call it space camp. Um, but we, you know, we go to these conferences and we get to meet all sorts of different kinds of saxophonists. It's wonderful. Um, mm. But the one limiting part of that is, is that we then become um, sort of isolated and we become maybe in a bubble, like I said. And so yeah. I would just encourage uh, the community to continue to reach out to other musical communities and uh, other instruments, other audiences, um, making, making, broadening the music. Um, and I think it's fantastic what with concert saxophone has been doing, um, not to, not to you know diminish what has been happening, uh, but I but I certainly think there is room to grow. I, I certainly think that um, our with all these premieres and all this new music that we're doing, we can we can not only like play it for the saxophone community, but we should try and get this out to the com- uh, larger uh, audiences as a whole. Right, because I think you also mentioned that you really care about diversifying the programming of music and to widen that experience as well, right? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, this is sort of going back to the what I had mentioned earlier, people want to experience music that feels representative of them, that they can identify with, that they can understand and um, feel moved by. And when, and, and actually, I think some of uh, this, uh, I think Nathan, the uh, violinist, I, I, was, I was watching that chat and mm-hmm. a lot of what he said re- uh, resonated yeah. with me in, in, terms of, in terms of the programming. Um, 
and and yeah. and I would agree with a lot of what he said in terms of like we have we should program in in reflection of society and um I think that the the classical canon is wonderful it's great um but there is room there's room for more um diversity in it and more representation and to speak from an authentic voice we should encourage um uh, people to to approach programming that way, and I, and I think the other part of that is, um, you know, we always talk about how classical music can sometimes be maybe uh, not accessible to people, and if we if we do it this way, I think more people will be inclined to be interested. So maybe what gets them interested is is a piece is a newer uh, is a different, you know, a programmed piece, but then they keep digging and they're like, oh, wait, like now I can go to some Beethoven and I, maybe it sounds different to me, or maybe I go to some Rachmaninoff and it's like, okay, you know, I, I'm starting to get what this whole classical thing is about now. Um, mm-hmm. So it's just about starting that spark for people. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm very curious to see and hear what, uh, pieces of music you would curate in our playlist i'm really curious <laughs> oh no no not too much pressure because maybe it's some no. really out there stuff but no I, I i enjoy i think my tastes tend to they go one way and then they go another but i i think it's just because i you know i really i when someone sends me something i i really like try to uh, get into it you know i i definitely didn't know what saxophone quartet could do before I um, was more introduced to it in college, and and my my professor Tamor Sullivan, he was he's a part of this of the Prism Saxophone Quartet, which is the sort of the premier uh, quartet with commissioning and everything. Um, mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, wow, there's like so much possible, um, you know. And one of my one of the things my gr- my group has done the past year is just more transcriptions. And we, one of the uh, pieces was the Ravel String Quartet. Uh, we, we played and recorded the first movement, as well as um, uh, Florence Price's um, Adoration, which was actually re- written for, for organ as first. Um, but there are just so many, I think the saxophone is unique in that way because it's so versatile. Um, it can traverse so many different sounds and, and genres. Um, and then we we took a stab at the the Beethoven string quartet, um, and uh, I, I, <laughs> it's it's definitely difficult because the strings are so it's so much easier for them to articulate passages, um, yeah. and for us we're we're over here tonguing and double tonguing and, and so yeah. we're trying to approach the music making from a point of ease like that is is mm-hmm. such a challenge for us but we, we really enjoy doing that wow beethoven string quartet by saxophones i'm just trying to picture that sonically wow yeah and, and one of the, the <laughs> debates is sort of like you know do you approach it just the way a string I was about would, to ask that it. because you were saying that you want to achieve the same sort of ease that string players can easily achieve just mechanically speaking, it's easier. So yeah. Right. Or, you know, does it then become kind of a new piece that is done on saxophone? You know, do we, do we stay true to the saxophone color or do we, Mm -hmm. do we, you know, try as hard as possible to imitate what a string would do, but, you know, at the end of the day, we have to make it sound good. And that's, that's the important part. Um, like the other the the other debate comes in with we've uh, recently also played the um, uh, I think it's Bach Italian uh, Italian concerto yeah the third movement we we did that for uh, the NASA competition that is so hard even for the piano the fingers to articulate every single oh yeah no. I mean we are you know you know we're we are listening to pianists do it. And 
it's like okay Most as a quartet can't play evenly. how do you <laughs> how do we try to do we try to do the same ease and everything as in the way they do it but or do we um you know do we approach it differently i mean mm-hmm. there's also this different aspect of equal temperament versus just temperament tuning oh yeah um and so there's just many many different um not issues but just uh interpretational decisions but i think it's really enjoyable because of that it's it's this process of listening and trying experimenting and then deciding performing it one way then trying it again later and then performing it a different way and i I don't know i really i've learned to value that process because it's um you know it can seem kind of uh maybe can seem a little bit uh cumbersome but there's a lot of like fun and uh and free uh decision making in in that process Mm -hmm. as well yeah it sounds like a very fun and creative process of interpretation have there been do you remember anything just from the top of your head of instances where you've had to change a certain way of how it was written uh stylistically because you have had to adapt it to your saxophone do you have any like concrete examples because again i am so new to this this is whole that world of saxophone. yeah uh i'd probably go back to the string quartet uh, ravel string quartet which was done by our soprano saxophonist evan harris um mm. so he uh so you know we read it down first and it was pretty much a straight uh transcription of the piece but we, as we continued to play it, we found that sometimes, you know, the ranges of the viola versus the alto saxophone and the the um, second viol or so, sorry, the viola versus the tenor and then the second violin for the alto, it's not always it's it's not the same. You know, it's not always conducive to each other. Mm-hmm. So one of the things we did was there were moments where we reversed those two voices. And, and mm-hmm. the blend was much better, much easier. Um, and then there's the aspect of pizzicato. And um, so, you know, that's a really challenging part, but we basically slap tongue. And the, the slap tongue is essentially making a suction on the reed and you, and you let go of the tongue and it makes this popping sound. But you can't just straight slap tongue because that's too percussive. And so to achieve the pits, we had to figure out how to uh, ret- like basically use air to retain parts of the pitch, but not slap too hard as to make it really thunk. You know, we wanted to make it light and, and still have the pitch to it. Um, especially, you know, at the end of the first movement, there's this really delicate like, dum, ding, you know, moving up the... Uh, arpeggio and we experimented with changing it in the voices um you know making it um lighter and um that that was just another aspect of the transcription that we we spent a lot of time going through how long does it take for you to do of that transcription and arrangement um i i would i i've done a couple of arrangements and the it takes a while it takes i mean over you know tens tens of hours sometimes you know um i would i think evan evan has done a lot more um and so he's probably gotten faster and faster at it um but it it's it can be kind of time consuming for sure it's almost like recomposing something yeah uh, i mean a little bit because like as you're doing it you want you you still have to make certain decisions articulation wise and, and voicing wise. Mm, yeah. I'm so curious to listen to some <laughs> saxophone quartet music right now, but uh, yeah, it's been fascinating to hear about your experience. Anything else you'd like to share with the listeners that I haven't touched on? Um, I, th- I mean, I think you've, you've touched on a lot of really important topics. Um, you know, I just, uh, again, encourage people to to go out there and uh, listen to something new today that you did have never listened bef- to before. Perhaps like your curated playlist. That you, <laughs> I am now uh, giving you the slight little pressure to make for us, if that's okay. For sure, for sure. Uh, I'm definitely very curious. So 
thank you. I think well, thank that's you. it for this episode. <laughs> it's been so great. Thank you so much. There is the soprano saxophone, and then there's like sopranino, which becomes like, you know, it's sorry the screen is okay like you know it's maybe like this big oh. um but i will show you the soprano saxophone yeah please do Ooh, i'm excited <laughs> this is and it, this is why uh people confuse this with a golden clarinet but oh wow yeah so this is the soprano saxophone so then the i don't i don't know even what you call the 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 neck part, the part where the sound comes out Oh, the bell, yes. The bell, yes, the bell. It's not even curved up. No, no. There, there are certain kinds that do curve up, but this typically this one just like a we call it the devil stick. How come? Because it's just notoriously difficult to to be in tune with. <laughs> ah, but so but it's I, so much smaller. So did you start out with this as a kid, or do you start with the bigger ones? Um, you start. You definitely move on to this after you've done alto. Ah, and so that's okay. the that's the um, usually the beginner one. There's like a student model that you then you can upgrade, and it's not like different size. It's just like it's there's more buttons to press. Um, ah, okay, that makes sense because your yeah. hands are probably so, tiny back then. <laughs> yeah, this one is, uh, but it's still like compared com on on a ten year old, it, it looks it looks big. Yeah, know? but um, at least it has fewer buttons. I guess how many buttons? As opposed to the adult sized or the normal ones, um, I would say it's so. <laughs> I'm not sure how to because there's so many that there's the there's usually the six that um, are on the front, but the the one the student models typically do not have one of these, which is the F sharp key. Mm. Um, it's basically allows you to play into higher register. Mm. Um, and then there is, uh, the tenor saxophone. So the tenor saxophone is this, is the bigger one here. You mm. may you probably have seen more of this one because it's got this little curve in the neck. Yes. looks um, like a duck. Yeah. <laughs> and then I, I don't have the last one, but it's the baritone saxophone, which mm. is much bigger. Um, and it actually goes even bigger than that. There's like a bass saxophone yeah, yeah, yeah. and two backs. Um, <laughs> so so then do all saxophonists usually have different kinds? You know, usually I think nowadays people, it's it's important to learn uh, to to double uh, or double oh. to, be, but to, be, to be able to play auxiliary horns. And um, so typically it'll at least be alto and soprano. Um, sometimes tenor, yeah. um, and and then baritone as well. But um, rarely do you see people going beyond that. Thank you very much for listening. If you would like to know more about Together with Classical and our charity efforts or support us, please go to our website, www.togetherwithclassical.org, or follow us on social media. Subscribe to our YouTube for more episodes of Classical Chats, or follow us on our podcast, whichever platform you choose.